All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, hanging out. We're going to be talking about the car reinvented. My name is Corey Cantor. I am a transport analyst at Bloomberg NEF. And we're going to be joined on stage by four great panelists to talk about the car reinvented, as well as all aspects of mobility, including electrification, autonomous vehicles. All right. I'm going to introduce the panelists first. And then after I introduce all four of you guys, we're going to go one by one a little bit more about what you do. So first we got to my right, Jacqueline Piero, the Vice President of Policy at Nuvi. Next to her, we've got Trevor Paul, the Chief Mobility Officer for the State of Michigan. After that, we got Jose Diaz Salazar, a Senior Manager at ANGO and Innovation Lab. And then finally, last but not least, we got Michael Batiglia, the Senior Vice President of Sales and Business Development at Blink Charging. So to start, Jackie, maybe a little bit about what you do at Nuvi. Uh, and you know what you've uh, worked on lately. So, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I am the vice president of policy for Nuvi Holding Corporation. Nuvi is a tech company. Actually, we have a software platform that coordinates, controls, and aggregates electric vehicles. We're particularly interested in bi-directional or B2G electric vehicles, but really any vehicle will do. And uh, we use our platform to make them into a usable uh, resource for the electric grid and to ease the integration of electric vehicles onto the grid. I uh, generally spend my time trying to match up what we want to do with what we're allowed to do uh, in various geographies and uh, help change the rules to actually make room for electric vehicles as a storage resource on the grid. Great. Thank you, Jackie. All right, Trevor, you're up. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, so I'm Trevor Paul. I'm a chief mobility officer for the state of Michigan. As far as I know, I think I'm the first chief mobility officer of the state, but I, I can almost guarantee that I won't be the last uh, because states need to begin to dedicate 24-7 res uh, resources to focusing on, on policy matters and programming matters as it relates to mobility, not just the future of automotive, but multimodal future. And you know, in Michigan, one in every five jobs is a mobility industry job. So it impacts everything. And so our mission is very much, you know, you can build a stronger state economy through safer, more equitable, and environmentally sound transportation for all, all residents. I think in the past, places like Detroit have separated industry growth from community vitality, and you, you just can't do that anymore. Um, you know, I, I think about some of our guiding principles, and uh, I think you know we need to take a systems level approach because, frankly, like. If you go anywhere in Detroit right now, it's all about electric vehicles, but did you know there's less parts than electric vehicle? There's gonna be natural displacement in our industry if we don't extend beyond sedans and SUVs. And so my job is very much about um, creating policies and, and new initiatives that help transition our workforce, uh, ready our infrastructure for electric vehicles and, and ensure that you know we're, we're looking across the different sort of ways that uh, you know a state needs to be involved in the mobility industry moving forward. So great to be here. Great, thanks Trevor. All right, Jose? Yeah, I'm gonna try to follow with energy. <laughs> that good intro. Uh, I'm Jose, it's awesome to be here. Uh, it's good to leave, uh, you know, the confinement of my living room and my Zoom meetings and everything and just be able to see everybody. So stoked to be here and, and talk about mobility. Um, I, I lead uh, Ango by Goodyear. It's, it's a fleet servicing platform that essentially connects service providers with uh, new mobility fleets that are connected vehicles and, and we can take advantage of that data to do the matchmaking uh, and, and, and get them the services that they need at the right location and time so we can maximize their uptime. Um, and Ango is operated as kind of like a, a startup within Goodyear. It has uh, levels of independence uh, that enables us to, to create a new business model and to, to build a, a more digitally enabled business, um, which is great. And that's why we're based out of San Francisco. Uh, we are also, uh, we were born from the innovation lab in San Francisco that me and my team, we, we founded in, in 2017 to kind of answer this question of like, what is Goodyear going to do with the future of mobility? The, the, the fast pace that things are changing uh, is getting a little bit out of control. And how do we answer some of the questions of like, you know, what kind of business are we going to be in in 10, 15, 20 years? Uh, so the lab took that uh, challenge and, and still working on that. And and from that, we, we have Ango today, uh, which is really interesting. 
Uh, the other thing we do too from the lab, we, we've founded or started our, our CVC or investment arm. We put a hundred million dollars for the next few years to, to go into new mobility. So we invested in companies like, uh, like Too Simple or Organic or, or Amp Up and, and you know, obviously going to continue to do that, which is, it's great because it's kind of like another tool in a toolbox of Goodyear to, to be able to, to, to be a player, right? And, and I think at the end of the day is we want to be uh, part of change, you're not a victim of it. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I, I say this to my team, and I see a few of you guys here, is uh, when I landed in Silicon Valley some years ago, and I was like, all right, what are we going to do with, with Goodyear? Somebody told me, yeah, Goodyear has to become, uh, or they say a tire company has to become a tech company before a tech company becomes a tire company. And obviously, like, I don't expect, like, Amazon to start, like, shooting tires out of, like, some sort of facility, <laughs> but I do expect them to, like, sell them way better than others do or, or do things like that. So, uh, I think in a way we're, we're trying to answer some existential questions and, and try to be a player in sustainability and mobility as well. You never know, Jose. Amazon could be shipping tires with you guys in the future out of uh, space rockets. Um, all right. Finally, uh, Michael, can you talk about Blink and yeah. what's up lately? Thanks. Thanks, Corey. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike Battaglia. I run sales and business development uh, for Blink. Uh, that also includes a team uh, that is responsible for things like grant opportunities, RFPs, which are coming uh, at an amazing clip right now based on the excitement in the industry. Uh, the story of Blink is uh, really there's three legs to the stool. So uh, Blink is an EV charging infrastructure company. So we sell charging stations. We are one of the largest owner operators of charging stations across the country. Uh, second leg of the stool is we're also a mobility company. And a lot of people actually don't know that, but we have a subsidiary called Blink Mobility, which runs the Blue LA EV car sharing program here in the city of LA. So that is a partnership uh, with the city. In fact, the general manager of that is Michael Uribe, who's sitting in the second row here. So if I can't answer any questions about that, he certainly can. Uh, and then the third leg of the stool that we're pursuing is uh, integrating interesting technologies into EV charging stations. So you have an EV charging station and you know, cities are deploying, you can kind of use your imagination here, other uh, telecommunications equipment and things like that. And there is an opportunity to combine these two things so that you don't have multiple pieces of equipment kind of running up and down a street, but you have one. So um, that's, that's really the story of Blink. At the end of the day, we're very, very interested in being an owner operator of EV charging stations across the country. Great. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, and thanks again for everyone joining us this afternoon here and online. I think we're at a particularly exciting moment for not only the car uh, reinventing itself, but the EV industry overall. And we're gonna dig into some of what you guys do, but also this particular moment kind of coming two years out from a pandemic. And the industry has changed a lot since we were probably all able to be together in a room. Uh, so to get started on some individual questions, Jose, I'm gonna start with you. We've done a lot of talking on this kind of front end back end debate of, you know, what are mobility companies focusing on, whether it's your Uber or Lyft designing a new app for car sharing, can you talk about that and in terms of Ango, how you're working on the back end and why that matters? Yeah, and, and if you're software engineers, you're gonna hate this analogy because front end and back end obviously mean different things. But the way I, I kind of explain it and, and we, we talk about it a lot in our team is we're thinking what's the architecture of mobility that, that we wanna kind of define for ourselves so it makes sense. And, and we came out with this concept. It's, it's the front end is essentially uh, everything that enables the customer experience that we'll use, right? The spin that we're going to, you know, kind of use and book and then go and, you know, drive that scooter around or ordering an Uber or, or reserving a Turo car, like all those kinds of things that enable the sharing space of, of EVs, potentially later AVs. I mean, today in San Francisco, and I, I guess in Phoenix too, you can order a, a self-driving taxi, essentially, uh, that doesn't come with a driver. Uh, and, and, you know, all those things, I refer to them, we refer to them as as the front end of mobility, right? And then you have a bunch of things that have enabled that technologies, uh, you know, first disruption of technology, e-commerce, uh, location services, uh, booking services, routing, all these kinds of cool things that we see today packaged very nicely in an Uber application, for example. But on the other side, there's still the vehicles, there's still the tires, the cleanings, all those kinds of things that are more like physical world things that they still have to happen. And, and that's what we refer to as the back end of mobility. And it's what's going to happen like as we reinvent the car, what is going to be reinvented in how we service that car and how we how we make that car available for the next thing, right? 
Uh, during the pandemic, some of our customers saw rocket, uh, skyrocketing numbers in utilization. That meant like services, the window for making a service became shorter and shorter, which means that technology will have to be enabled more and more. So like what we think is like, we can go in and look at the back end of mobility that we feel is really in, in, in a lot more emphasis stages that, that what we're seeing today in mobility and some of the experiences and really, you know, create something there that, that keeps enabling uh, the whole kind of ecosystem as, as we go and get more EVs out on the road, uh, potentially AVs very soon, uh, and then other kinds of transportation like micro mobility or the VTOLs that we see here, for example. Great. Thank you, Jose. Switching next to Jackie. Uh, though you've been working with Nuvi for a long time, seeing different aspects of the EV industry grow and change. Are there any projects in the last 12 months that you're particularly excited about and that Nuvi is focused on? I wouldn't say it's one particular project so much as just a, I can feel building momentum around the technology. And that's everything from utilities starting to actually want to make specific programs and rates around vehicle to grid, around the capability of a bi-directional EV to actually provide a service to them to in the, uh, in the infrastructure bill that just passed there's $75 billion of funding that V2G is specifically laid out as qualifying for. And it's not just infrastructure funding, it's V2G as a grid flexibility, as smart grid, as resiliency, as ways to build out the grid more efficiently. And so just seeing that kind of focus coming up both at the national level and at the state level across the country, Oregon, Colorado, New York, all across the country is really exciting. We can actually feel that there is a place for this technology, in particular school buses because of the California um, Energy Commission program, a school bus replacement program that actually gave a specification to the school bus makers of the United States. They wanna make an electric school bus for this program. It has to be V2G capable. And by doing that, they actually launched a new section of the industry. And so now we have Bluebird buses that are V2G capable being sold all across the country. And these things are going to be sitting in the parking lot waiting for someone to actually decide how best to use them to assist the customer or the grid. That resource, just starting with school buses. There are 500,000 school buses in the United States. If those are all electric, if they are all capable of discharging their battery when needed, that alone is just an incredible resource. But if you look at the entire light vehicle fleet, that resource is going to dwarf the stationary battery capacity that we're able to actually put out. We cannot ignore that. We have to start including electric vehicles as part of the picture when it comes to solar, to batteries, to heat pumps. EVs have to be right in there. And it is, that's what I'm excited yeah. about in the last year. Awesome. Yeah, we'll come back to V2G a little bit too. Um, all right. So jumping from kind of talking about V2G to the charging, uh, Michael, you talked about what Blink does, uh, but can you give us some stats, some numbers on, you know, how large is Blink's charging network um, what states are you focusing on and what are the early kind of challenges you found, but also the kind of opportunities on charging? Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, so I always have to be careful about these numbers because <laughs> we're publicly traded and I got to get them right. So, <laughs> um, so if you look at Blink globally, uh, we just acquired a company in Europe called Blue Corner, which added a lot of uh, charging points to our portfolio. Uh, but if you look at it globally, we have about 30,000 chargers that have either been sold or deployed since the company's inception, right? And then you start to break that down and it becomes a little bit closer to 18,000 in the US and then a little over 7,000 of those are what we call networked chargers. So they're on the Blink network. Uh, and then about 4,600 are publicly accessible on the Blink network. So there's a lot of layers to this, but um, what we're really uh, targeting uh, are chargers out in the public domain uh, that are connected to the Blink network for sure. Great, thanks Mike. Yep. All right, and then Trevor, uh, New Jersey does not have a chief mobility officer, but if you were a state thinking about putting, uh, you know, someone in a position like yourself, you know, how did, how did your position get formed? And what type of early lessons do you have for states that are thinking about creating kind of a, I guess, an EV czar of some sort? 
Yeah, so, um, I mean, we, my role in ultimately our office uh, was created to be an air traffic controller. Um, you know, traditionally transportation is left to the Department of Transportation, but uh, now, you know, obviously with electric vehicles, but even more so where you need to put mobility infrastructure, you're, <laughs> the DNR is involved. Yeah. Like obviously labor and economic development become players. And so ideally the goal is to draw through lines between all the different departments and create tangible outcomes. Um, so one of the things that we, we tried to do, um, and it, frankly, it's something Michigan should do, right? I mean, we're the, we, we did the three color traffic signal. That was us, lane markings, that was us. <laughs> and we're, we're now sort of in this 10 to 15 year window where there's gonna be new infrastructure that's gonna impact over the next, you know, the next hundred years. So working together, we're, we're launching a, an electric vehicle circuit up and down Lake Michigan. Uh, reliable charging experiences, uh, reliable charging locations. And ultimately we'd like to draw it around the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, we uh, recently just announced a dynamic wireless charging corridor where the road is actually equipped to charge the vehicle while it's in motion. These are not just transportation projects. These are uh, energy projects. These are workforce projects. These are tourism projects. So the idea of this office was really to, to sort of spin everything together to make some statement wins that can drive national conversations. That's great. And a quick follow-up in terms of the goals that Michigan has set as, as a state, you know, where are you aiming to go in the next five to 10 years as you kind of plot out the role that EVs will play and then eventually AVs as well? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the goals are twofold. So I think as we see increases in electric vehicle adoption from 3% to 14% to 30% by 2030, whatever it is, we need to make sure that we, we educate the public as to how to use an EV, how to use charging infrastructure, um, and, and frankly, we need to provide tools, both to fleet operators and to individual customers, you know, that helps uh, sort of make the purchase a bit easier and reduces range anxiety in the process. Um, so, so I know those aren't like quantitative goals, but, um, you know, when you think about quantitative goals, I, I'd like to see right now we have 600 miles of connected corridor. I'd like to double that in the next couple of years. Um, so thinking about smart infrastructure, just like how we're thinking about charging infrastructure um, and uh, another going back to workforce. Um, we have about 45,000 workers, mostly in the Detroit area, that will be impacted by the switch from internal combustion engines to battery electric. It's about 300 companies. 60% are slated to be impacted in a negative way. So how do we begin to transition those workers and those companies to an electrified future? That, that's on my mind. And ideally, we'd like to hit that you know, 45,000 number uh, later in the decade to say, okay, we, we transition that entire group of people that are an important part of our economy into sort of the future economy. Great, thanks Trevor. And coming back to Jackie on V2G, because I promised I'd ask a little bit more about it. You know, what are the opportunities that utilities have uh, when you're speaking to them about the school buses, for example? Do they, are we close to kind of seeing those benefits or do you think it's a couple of years out in terms of utilities using it on kind of a mass scale? It, we're seeing it right now in California um, as the state has realized that they have a five gigawatt energy uh, availability shortfall starting this coming summer and continuing for several years afterwards, they are looking for any kind of demand response or energy uh, resource that they can find. The window for installing new storage or solar is closing for the next couple of years. And so we actually have B2G written into the new initiative uh, as a qualifying uh, resource to be included in, uh, in this emergency load reduction program. And so utilities actually will uh, be compensating B2G resources as they're available. We know that there are already definitely buses that are deployed. Some have B2G chargers and some don't, but this is our chance to actually get B2G chargers matched up with the buses and have those be part of the solution to a, frankly, a rolling crisis that California is experiencing. So you, you got me all fired up. Can I talk <laughs> about school buses for a second? Yeah, go for it. Oh my God. Like school districts are where we educate our kids. We play sporting events there. We vote there. Why can't they be these, these power factories? And, and think of the revenue that you pump into places like the Detroit public schools if you got demand response right. Not to mention, if the grid went down, you could roll the school bus over to a nursing home and power it for an afternoon if you needed it. So just the, the sort of the public sector aspect to some of the technology and the policies that you're talking about is just absolutely enormous. Sorry to hijack. 
Newbie.com, guys. <laughs> Newbie.com. <laughs> also, when it comes to school buses, this is a chance to help more schools electrify faster. Because right now, an electric school bus is three times the cost of a diesel. Schools want to electrify, but right now, they're only able to do it at the pace of subsidies. And they are definitely, they're filling out their grant applications. They are trying to electrify. And so we can tell that there's actually an opportunity there too. We've actually formed a, uh, a joint venture uh, to finance, to do a current turnkey financing solution to help schools have the upfront cash to actually put down for an for a EV school bus if they want to get one. We have to actually just enable them to buy the bus. And that's one of the ways that we want to accelerate electrification. That's great. Mike, yeah. do you want to jump in? Yeah, not, I mean, not to be Debbie Downer on this a little <laughs> bit, but um, you know, one of the challenges though that all of us are facing are, and, and these are the things we're, we're all dealing with as an industry, the chipsets that you yeah. integrate into, let's say a charging station to enable V to G have a 52 week lead time right now. So like, those are the kind of things that we have to overcome, right? And they're really big headwinds that I think every, probably everybody's facing, but um, you know, so we're all kind of racing to get there and we're like right there. And then, you know, you know you're gonna get your mail in 52 weeks, right? To be able to start doing this, right? So it, um, you know, it, it, comes with, it comes with a ton of challenges. Um, you know, when it comes to V to G too, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see exactly how this is going to work. I'm a little bit of a skeptic on B2G and I'm not a skeptic on it with fleets. I think for fleets, I get it. It makes a lot of sense, but for the individual consumer, I'm really wondering how that's going to look right. Because most consumers I think are going to be pretty wary about the power company kind of pulling the energy off my car. And is it going to be, you know, ready to go the next morning, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, all of these things wind up working themselves out, right? And consumers get used to them, just like they get used to adaptive cruise control and autonomous and everything else. But, but I think on the consumer side, B2G is gonna, gonna take a while. I mean, that's why a company like mine exists. I agree that the utility should not be just turning off the, or, or discharging the battery whenever they see fit. These are not air conditioners. And utilities don't actually usually have that visualization of the customer level need, but also they have never had to think about when did this car get back? What is the battery look like now? When is it going to leave again? And that is exactly what Newbie's platform actually does, which is say the first priority is to charge the person's car. The second priority is to understand what kind of leeway do we have in between when they got home and when they need that car charged for their next trip? And once we've made that determination, we can actually say, okay, that combined with 5,000 of their friends, what can we actually offer to the utility as a reliable, dispatchable aggregate? We have done this with single cars, one or two cars in Denmark uh, for the last five years where it is onesies, twosies, fivesies. And the only difference that these customers have noticed in their EV experience is that it's better because they don't have to worry about when they're plugging in their car to get it actually charged. So we know that it can be done. It's actually also a matter of convincing the utility that it's gonna work. So there is a lot of education. There's a lot of socialization of it to be done. But um, I believe that there will be different applications that will actually be appropriate for different people's driving patterns. And understanding that is how we truly integrate EVs into the grid. Great. All right. So I think we're going to hit on another controversial topic in a, in a few seconds. But to kind of come back to the, the car reinvented, I think that change in relationship between the car, the utility, charging it up. Uh, infotainment is this word kind of thrown around a little bit. Uh, now that you have a car that can update and change software over the internet, uh, maybe have a movie, maybe have a uh, sound effect. Curious in, in each of your guys' work, and maybe Mike, I'll start with you on the charging side, how the relationship between a consumer and their car or their charger will change beyond the kind of primary function. Um, and if that's a, you know, a revenue stream opportunity. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah good. So there's, I, I think there's a, a few aspects to this. First of all, when you talk about the car reinvented, you know, when you, my, 
whole career has been in the automotive industry. And uh, one of the reasons why I came to Blink was because the excitement around product development on the EV side is just incredible, right? So instead of having, you know, an internal combustion engine sitting in the front, uh, or sometimes the rear, but mostly the front that you have to kind of design the car around, you have this fantastic platform that's flat as a pancake. And the engineers and the designers are totally unshackled with what they can do, right? And so that's why you're going to see all these amazing designs uh, coming to market. And, you know, the, the, the beginnings of them are things like these you know, the frunks and the be, you know, in the front of the, of the car, right. The F-150 lightning that's coming out has this massive frunk and it can do all kinds of things. Right. So one of it, one aspect of it is that the second aspect of it is it's going to allow the automakers to do really creative things inside the car electronically. So you might buy a car uh, as a consumer. And by the way, Tesla's already doing this. Uh, so you buy a car as a consumer and it comes with a set of features and you've signed up for that set of features and you've paid for that set of features. But then you, you figure out that in the car has more features. So as you're playing with the software in the car, you know, in a Tesla is a great example. If I wanted to, and I think the number is two or $3,000, I can literally push a button and I get 50 more horsepower in that car, right? I didn't even actually know that that was the case when I bought the car. But there's a few other features in the car like that, right? And autonomous is the big one, right? At Tesla, you know, for 10 grand, at least it, I think they pulled it down, but you can get nearly autonomous. So those are just a couple examples, I think, of what you're going to see from the automakers, where there's going to be things, subscription services, other things in the car that allow the automaker to monetize that customer on a much more consistent basis over, the, over their ownership life cycle, as opposed to now you know, it's pretty much you buy a car, you've paid your money and, you know, that's about it, right? Maybe you have Sirius XM, that kind of thing. But there's, it's going to open up a whole new uh, world of opportunities. Commensurate with that, sorry for the uh, long-winded answer. Um, <laughs> when it comes to the charging piece of it, it definitely completely changes the customer's behavior, right? So the statistics are that about 80% of all charging events are going to happen at home, right? Somebody's going to have a charging station in their garage, or in uh, you know, their, their multifamily parking spot, whatever it might be. But there is going to be a ton of behavior that changes with respect to when I charge and the way I charge uh, when I'm out about my daily life. And one of the things we love about being an infrastructure company is that this concept of people can do two things at one time. I can be at the gym if there's a charging station there and I can be charging my car while I'm at the gym. I can be at the mall and my car can be feeling while I'm at the mall, right? As opposed to an internal combustion engine, I go to the gas station. The only thing I'm going to the gas station for is to get gas, right? So it really creates this kind of cool thing where you have all this distributed infrastructure out there and I, can, and I don't have to worry about a dedicated trip, let's say to, to charge my car, right? It's kind of always available where I am uh, in my lifestyle. Great. Can I jump in about something yeah, that you just okay. said? You know, there, there's a statistic that, is I think it's true right now, this idea that 80% of charging is gonna be done at home. And I think that that's, that's looking at things the wrong way to say, well, people are gonna to wanna to charge at home. So we have to figure out how to make that happen. Why? Why can't we like, if, if in California, we have this massive solar resource during the day, God, tell people to charge at work, make it free to charge at work, have the EVs help actually use that solar resource. It doesn't have to be the way it is now. And rethinking that is how we actually integrate EVs to the grid. Great. I say I want to get your take on the, the kind of changing relationship between the consumer, or at least the, the folks that you work with at Ango and cars as they're becoming electrified. Yeah, I, I, I think, well, one, one, of our, one of our first ever customers for Ango that, that we, all, we facilitated services uh, for, and we do all kinds of services for them, uh, some of them being charging as well. Um, it, it, it is one of our first customers was an EV. And, and I think it's been um, very interesting because when you run the numbers and you understand the cost of, of ownership of running a fleet of EVs, it turns out that now the number one cost is tires. Uh, and, you know, we were talking earlier, like tires is, is not the most sexiest thing. Uh, nobody really likes to pay for tires in reality. And we were even comparing to go into the dentist 
uh, as an experience of purchasing something. Uh, um, and it's just reality. I mean, it's not like a pleasant thing that you're like, oh, I'm happy that I got to pay $800 for a root canal. <laughs> um, but but I think that, you know, with, with EVs for us, it all comes down to, you know, the car reinvented. The first thing that happened with the car reinvented, in my opinion, was the ability to the car to grab some of that information and data that it has and be able to put it somewhere in the cloud so other people can grab it and, and start working with it, right? And that was, I think, the moment that we started thinking about things we could do outside of what the OEMs would allow us to do with, with any of that data, right? Uh, and I think for us, grabbing that data and being able to be pro predictive about maintenance and being able to like know when things are gonna happen ahead of time so we can have the right materials or the right services right there, uh, I think, you know, that's, you know, our essentially our core value prop uh, when it comes to EVs today. Go for it, Trevor. Can I go? Yeah. All right. I'm going. <laughs> um, so uh, we look at it a little differently. Connectivity. Um, you know, I think like over half of the value of a vehicle by 2030 will be software. Uh, I, I think the stat is like, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think by 2026, 75 percent of cars on the road will be connected in some way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. So as government, it's incumbent upon us to create the environments around the connectivity and make sure they're safe and secure. Um, but I think that gets really hard because I think with the rise of vehicle connectivity, you're going to see wearables accelerate. And the future of wearables, I think, will be the disappearance of them and your earring and your wedding ring and, and that syncing. Um, and frankly, that entire experience as you're driving down the road needs to be something that you, know, you feel confident in. You know, one of the things we're doing in Michigan that's, that's pretty cool is um, we're building the road of the future. We're building this autonomous vehicle lane. It's going to be a 40 mile lane between Detroit and Ann Arbor. And it's in, in concert with um, sidewalk infrastructure partners, which is Alphabet's uh, infrastructure investment arm. But we're focused on the future of connectivity along that lane, um, both from sort of a CV to X uh, and 5G perspective, but also DSRC in, in certain situations. Um, I, I think the road has to play a part in the safety and the effectiveness of connectivity in the vehicle. And that, that's going to fall on the government to some degree. Great. Thanks, Trevor. And I want to come back to you as we open to the, the second, yeah, oh. second controversial topic or, or, or topic of debate around autonomous vehicles. Yeah. You know, pre-pandemic a couple of years ago, had a bunch of the BNF summits, which we put on. Uh, AVs were the next big thing and coming really, really soon. Um, obviously, a lot happens during a pandemic, a lot of other issues to work on. You know, is your perspective that AVs are just around the corner? Is it going to take a little bit longer? Are you bullish, a little bit more bearish? Oh, that's not as you say controversial. I was like, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? Man? <laughs> that's not so bad. Um, no, I mean, I think it's accelerating depending on what sector you're. I mean, like trucking, autonomous trucks. Um, you, you know, like you, you look at like um, Coco and and some of the. I mean, I guess I don't know if Coco is autonomous, but. Some of these robots that are autonomous, um, I think the movement of goods is where a lot of the momentum is around autonomy right now. And later in the decade, I can see it's shifting back once more the use cases are, are um, in lockstep to passenger AV. I mean, you know, right now, you, you know, you, you're seeing it feature by feature. Um, automated valet parking. In fact, in Detroit last week, Enterprise and Ford and, and Bosch, uh, uh, they tested a technology where you return your rental car, you just get out, and then um, the car finds its spot. and and Everything, once it, it finds its spot, starts wirelessly charging, it's a whole system. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think it's just shifting momentum, but uh, it's definitely still momentum. Great. Who wants this next? Any comments on AVs? Yeah, or on AVs. I, you know, we, we, we've been talking about it and, and I think that, you know, when you started, when we started hearing about this, I don't know, three years ago, four years ago, more seriously, like, there are two kind of things. There's the media getting really excited about it. And, and there was people kind of feeling that a bit. And that created false expectations. And we're looking at like, and this is something I heard from somebody that works in an AV company, but it stuck with me because I don't know if it's true, but he said solving like AVs in cities like San Francisco is harder of a computational problem than taking humans back to the moon uh, in some sort of capacity, right? So it's like, the amount of work that has to go there, I think that one camp is that, like the people that are really serious about it and are seeing uh, how the technology of AI and, and, and machine learning is being pushed and they're working on it every single day. They've known for a while that the roadmap was super hard and super long, uh, regardless of whatever the media was saying three years ago or whatever we were thinking, regardless of what our expectation one was. And I think there's a lot of people that like look at that and, and 
got really excited at the beginning and then we're pushing that roadmap to be faster and maybe even fueled by some, you know, owners of different companies or CEOs saying like, hey, by 2019, we're going to do this. And then, no, we're going to do it 2020. And no, we're going to do it 2021. And they just keep pushing, you know, uh, the delivery of whatever it was a year further out. But I think you're right. I mean, there there is so much uh, use cases and applications right now. Like there's this company called Starship that that we invested in. And we actually uh, service from the Anglo side. And it's these little robots that deliver food uh, by themselves. And they deliver groceries. They have this big, big, big project in London. They work with our grocery uh, store. But then they also do it here in different campuses where they have, you know, 30, 40, 50 of these guys just running around through campuses delivering food. And that's just another application that it's tiny and cool and cute. And if you look at it online, it's like, it looks pretty yeah. fun. But there's a lot of those things that I think are, are pushing forward. Uh, the holy grail is to be able to have cars in a city like LA driving themselves next to a car that I'm driving, mm -hmm. right? And that's hard, but you know, I'm an optimist. I still think it's there. I, really quickly. Um, yeah. So I, I think you'll see progress in autonomy when chunks of your drive get taken away from you, which sounds kind of bad if you love driving, but things like navigating a construction zone, um, valet park, not if you're a valet park, automated valet parking, things of that nature. Um, that's, that's how you should start measuring autonomy is the percentage by which you actually drive your vehicle going forward. Do I still think we're going to drive in 2040? Probably. Uh, I don't know much. Mike or Jackie, any, uh, any comments? On uh, I would just say I agree completely with both of those guys. And the thing that's <laughs> exciting is there is so much money going into this. It's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. It's just a question of the timeline and the applications and, you know, but it's, it's absolutely coming. Awesome. I, uh, I'm just way more interested in what the vehicle's doing while it's parked than what it's doing <laughs> while you're driving. That's fair. Um, well, great answers to AVs. I guess not as controversial as I thought. There's sometimes, you know, you get into big fights over it, like, oh, this will never happen and, and all that, but it's all good. Um, changing topic slightly, I used to work in the US Senate and um, whenever a bill passes, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, so about, I guess, earlier this week, maybe, uh, President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, that included in part $7.5 billion in charging money, uh, billions of dollars in school buses and transit buses. Um, there's another bill maybe on the way, we'll see. Um, but I want to get your guys' take on the infrastructure bill, uh, what provisions are there that are helpful, uh, and what you still think there needs to be more investment in. And Mike, I'm coming to you first because I feel like the, the key piece of that bill has been hyped as this $7.5 billion in charging. Uh, so what do you think? Yeah, so I mean, you know, the original uh, numbers that were being talked about were a lot more than that. But, you know, what, one of the things we say at Blink is, you know, seven and a half billion is a lot more than no billion. Uh, and it's a pretty nice, and it's a lot more than we had yesterday, right? So I think it's a great start. Uh, we're tremendously excited about it. Do we think we need more as a nation? Absolutely. But, uh, you know, it's going to get us on our way. And I think that it's one of those things, I think that when the country sees the benefits and the progress and EV adoption and all these things, right, kind of coming together simultaneously, more and more money will wind up you know, uh, going towards it's funny because I, I, I attended a governor's uh, reception a few months ago. So I met a few state governors uh, and it was a Republican governor's convention. And I said to the guys, you know, don't fight this one. You don't need to fight this one because the consumer's driving it. Right. It's going to happen. So, you know, you're sort of fighting City Hall if you're if you're not really with it. Um, and it's an easy one because the consumer and the automakers have already are already coming to the table. The, the, the product plans are already baked. Everything's already happening, right? It's not like, you know, if you guys resist, it's going to go back the other way, right? So it's, it, 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 it'll, it'll continue and it'll, it'll be more money eventually. Right. Jackie, any uh, other provisions in the infrastructure bill that you're excited about or, or areas that you think government at the federal level should be playing more of a role? Yeah, like I like I mentioned before, uh, the service transportation block grant that actually is funding EVSCs, it specifically says B2G actually qualifies for this. Uh, and then we've got the smart grid matching uh, grant program, which again, it's grants for just a whole range of things around, uh, around actually finally making the smart grid that we've been talking about for 20 years come to pass. And B2G actually is a qualifying uh, technology for that. But uh, beyond that, you know, this, this is also a signal from the federal government to industry 
that this is something that is desirable, that this is something that is fundable. But what I'd really like to see is like the EPA or at the state level, uh, CARB in, in California actually include vehicle to grid as a, as a, as a factor in their emissions uh, reduction programs. Meaning right now they're just looking at the tailpipe emissions of a car. They need to take the next step. We know enough about our electric grid. We know enough about the, the, the generators that are working or not working at any given time. We know what the carbon intensity of the grid is at any given time. And so what that car does when it is parked, how it charges, when it charges, if it discharges can have huge effects on how much renewable energy we can actually get onto the grid, what the carbon intensity of the grid is gonna be as we go from gasoline to electricity for our transportation system. So that's what I'm looking for next. Yeah. Trevor? Yeah. I know like you're excited. I'm like, when am I gonna sleep? Like <laughs> it feels like final exam week because there's a ton of money out there right now. Like you think about CARES Act dollars, you think about the American Rescue Plan dollars, which are now with the states, but we're trying to figure out how to spend that. And then you throw this into the mix. Um, it's exciting, but it can be abusive if we don't tie everything together. There, we need to overlay earlier investments with some of these new, new investments we're gonna get through this bill. Um, you know, I think there's like $39 billion for uh, buying new vehicles, buses, trains, things of that nature. We have to make sure that those, those buses and trains are equipped with the latest technologies, that we don't get caught up in our own procurement laws. And we end up buying a sort of vehicles that could be obsolete in a few years. So there's great responsibility here uh, that will fall primarily on the states and, and the cities. Um, so I think everyone's pretty eyes wide open, excited. It's a great thing. I love the idea of my kid who's two growing up and just feeling a lot safer on the road. But I mean, it's gonna require a lot of work to get it right. And Jose, any comments on the bill? Yeah, I mean, I full disclosure, my background is design, and I know very little about policy. <laughs> uh, but you know, for me, it's it's a little bit more simpler opinion, which is it's about it was about time. I I think that you know I was born and raised in Costa Rica, where I see no new mobility happening at all. Like nobody knows that cars are going to drive themselves one day. Like there's just no conversation about that in different parts of the world, right? The, the needs are different. And I think that obviously I feel super awesome and, and very lucky of, of living in San Francisco and seeing what's happening there and then being able to you know fly here and see what's happening here. So, uh, but that also always leaves me with a feeling of like, I see so much money and resources and, and creativity in those two cities and, and the rest of the US as well but there's, there was something missing, right? And I'm not saying that this is gonna be perfect. You're totally right. This is gonna be you know, a cluster in so many areas, <laughs> but it's gonna be, it's one of those problems that you're happy to have instead of the opposite, which is just you know, no, no, no imagination, no creativity, no, no resources. Um, I, I was telling uh, Corey earlier that I like to do experiments and I rented a, a Tesla Model 3 uh, and, and decided to drive from uh, San Francisco to Las Vegas. Um, and to make it more interesting and see how I do with range and anxiety, I invited my partner and our little baby in the <laughs> car with us. Um, and we, we, we went and we was like, the whole thing is like, all right, how is the experience of like stopping at the charging stations and, and you know, with a baby and, and needing to eat food or not, or waiting and charging. And then are you gonna actually get there? And when you're going through this, you know, the desert, it's like so hot that you need the AC blasting. So your battery range actually goes down and et cetera. Right. And it went well, like we survived the baby's okay, but like, <laughs> uh, but it was kind of stressful at times. So like that, those are the kind of like from more like just a normal person, like those are the kind of things that I like for them to improve uh, with this kind of funding. Right. I want to be able to uh, like we just sold our car and we're like, we're not buying a car until we have an electric vehicle, but I live in San Francisco. I don't have parking. So I have to park on the street and then I have to go and charge. So it's like, all right, I'm going to take this risks personally, but I kind of want them to be easier because I know other people are not adopting the technology until those things are solved. So I hope that money makes those things easier in others so we can start adopting for real. And so, so real quick, some of this stuff is, is interesting how simple it is, because when I'm talking to people, you know, that I'm friends with and neighbors, things like that, and, and we talk about electric vehicles, they almost all say exactly the same thing, which yeah. is, I'd really like to buy one next. 
but I just don't know where I'm going to charge it. And it also, it, it almost always comes back to that, right? So we, we solve that infrastructure mm -hmm. problem, uh, which in turn gives consumers a ton of confidence, right? And then they pull the trigger on buying a zero emission vehicle, an electric vehicle, whatever it might be, right? Great. I have uh, one more thing. <laughs> Very quick. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> right now, uh, just in a broader electrification scheme, you know, you've got this seventy-five hundred dollar tax credit that assumes your tax burden is seventy-five hundred dollars. Yeah. It assumes that you're already buying the car. It's a rebate. It assumes you have the money to buy these cars. And what we need is to get to the place. And what I would love for the federal government to be driving behind is development of very low cost electric vehicles, but also real development of used electric vehicle markets because we need to get to a place where the first vehicle a person can afford to buy can be electric and we are not there and uh, we need to figure out since we're up here solving problems multi-unit <laughs> dwelling charging we got to figure that out we're going to do a quick rapid question of 10 to 30 seconds each and then if folks have questions we have microphones there um so if you have questions get up there but last kind of panel question here is sort of mike one thing you're looking forward to in the year ahead or looking at and watching uh, in the EV space? Uh, Just one. I'm going to be very <laughs> selfish uh, on this one. I am looking forward to Blink getting their unfair share of the money that's out there. <laughs> and, and you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a two-edged sword, right? It's uh, We certainly want to be successful, uh, as everybody else up here does. Um, but, you know, the great thing about this space is that every single thing that you do is uh, towards a positive outcome, right? Not just for your business, but but for the community, for clean air, for all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, you know, the next year is just going to be a ton of fun. We're already seeing the momentum. It's 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 amazing. Jose? I, I have two quick ones. One EV, one AV. My EV is, I'm super excited to see Rivian and, and Lucid uh, competing with Tesla and making all the OEs, uh, you know, compete as well or get nervous. I I'm excited. I think Tesla has been amazing, obviously, and all, you know, all the great things they put out there. But it's just time, I think, that like other companies kind of go and, and play in the same field. So it's exciting to see next year with that. Uh, on the AV side, um, you know, Waymo VI, I think, and obviously Too Simple and Gatic and all these like applications delivering autonomously packages and, and doing long haul, like that's going to be pretty cool. That's probably going to be a lot sooner than, than we all expect. So I think there's going to be a lot of cool announcements. And for instance, your corridor and the way that you're designing it probably is thought for some of those applications to have, you know, uh, a way to, to go out faster and do things. So I think that's going to help the AV expectation kind of go down a little bit or, or be more managed. Yeah, so I, I think for me, I, I'm curious to see where all these battery plants end up <laughs> and um, large assembly plants. And I think that'll reshape some local economies and hopefully a few end up in Michigan. Right, Becky? I'm actually super jazzed about the uh, Ford F-150 yeah. Lightning. Um, yeah, absolutely. To have a legacy OEM put something like that out, one of their best selling yeah. models and make it electric. This is not a compliance car. They are trying to sell this thing. And that is a huge change. So I'm really looking forward to that coming out. Definitely looking forward to that too. Next spring in Michigan, everywhere else. Uh, well, if anyone has any questions, we got uh, microphones there. So you got to stand up and go to one of those mics so people online can hear it and then announce the uh, organization you're with and who you are. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Sarojini Lal and I work for the assembly, um, assembly member, Laura Friedman. She's the chair of the uh, transportation committee. Um, my question is related, I think, Jackie, it, for you, um, when you think about vehicle to grid, is it, is the demand more instantaneous or is it like a large demand where you're looking at hours and hours and hours of charging or is it like a nanosecond? And do we have a sense yet of what that demand is going to be? Uh, so you mean the the demand meaning like what is the grid going to need out of what the do, vehicle? What is the, do we know yet what the grid is going to be right. looking to these cars or to these trucks to provide? Is it going to be, you know, 10 seconds of a gap in the grid or is it going to be hours? Is it going to be everything in between? Because 
as an electric vehicle owner and driver, I think I would definitely, as an individual owner, have that anxiety because I, you know, I already have range anxiety because <laughs> um, I have a very old <laughs> electric car that can really only go about 60 miles before it runs out of juice. So do you think, um, you know, I, so when you spoke to that issue, I, that really resonated with me. So my, I guess my question is, what do you think the grid is really in, a, in real time going to be demanding from these vehicles? Um, you, you actually answered the question as you were asking it. Um, the grid has, and by the grid, I mean energy companies, utilities, system operators, uh, but also I think it can consist of the customer themselves with their home. Um, it can ask for seconds at a time. We're in markets in Denmark where we're being asked to modulate our rate of charge or discharge for seconds at a time. It could be minutes at a time if you have a solar company that is trying to even out the intermittency as mm -hmm. clouds are going over their farm, they may want to actually have essentially like a distributed contract where we can actually firm up their capacity. It could be for an hour at a time. That's a lot of uh, the sort of transmission level energy markets are an hour at a time. Uh, I don't see any universe in which I would want to try to actually have a customer discharging for four hours, six hours. Right. That's long duration storage and it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be in business very long if we were destroying people's batteries and leaving their cars uncharged. So it is a matter of looking at the way that you use your car, understanding how to take care of your battery, and then figuring out what fits in between there. Got it. Thank you very much. Great. All right, I think we are at time. Well, I just want to thank all you guys for joining me on the panel up here. Let's give a round of applause. And thank you all for coming out.